name is Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awaken the Dream. My friends, I am my guest today, and I am very deeply inspired by my latest guru. His name is Dr. Amit Goswami. He's an Indian philosopher. He's a quantum physicist, and he has put out a DVD called Quantum Activist, of which I don't know if I haven't seen it four times at least because it just inspired me so much. So this is a special program in gratitude to Amit. And the name is not easy to say, but I hope I'm doing all right with it. Um, as a scientist and as a quantum physicist, Amit uh, wrote the, the, the best um, textbook for those studying quantum physics. He's in all the colleges. He was raised a Hindu. His father was a religious leader who had all kinds of friends in their living room. And as a typical teenager, it's so interesting being taught the Upanishads and all of that, he didn't want anything much to do with it. So he went his way and became quite a scholar and just climbed up the scholastic ladder. And uh, Today, he is so humbled by the work that he has done with quantum physics and how the door to spirituality has opened for him. And I want to try and explain how that door did open. As I studied his work and I thought about what quantum scientists do, quantum means d dissolving everything down into as little fine uh, super particles. It just gets refined, refined, refined. What scientists have always done trying to figure out what the heck we are and what are we doing here and how were we born or what's the meaning of life or did we evolve from plants, animals to cavemen to human beings, uh, creationism, Scientology, whatever. Um, he didn't seem to be able to be satisfied, like the science he was studying wasn't satisfied. It, it was a myriad of experiences that sort of locked him into, all right, we can't locate the heart. As he studied the brain and the body and the molecules and the protons and all of, all of that within the realm of the material world, uh, scientists have always taught us that, well, we're human, but yes, we're material. Um, we came from materialism, and that's where we are. That's what I learned, in a sense, without it being worded that way, in school. So in school, I was taught about atoms and protons, and I was taught about the material world. And way back then, um, it just wasn't knowledge that there was another world of spirit, that part of why we are here in our bodies with a subtle body, a material body, chakras, inner chakras of energy, that now uh, the knowledge is not only out, but it's almost as if it's no longer an abstract idea. We've all heard Deepak Chopra and so many people talking about the quantum leap. And so what happened was after, I would say, all of this stuff, Studying that Amit did, one of the greatest, uh, I would say, scientific evidences he found about a non-local world, the, the world of consciousness, of spirit, was from another scientist who called him to say, come and check, take a look at this experiment I just did. So he flew out to LA, I believe, and there was an experiment between two people who had their little helmets on with all the electrodes on it, but no connection to each other. It was an experiment about non-local thinking, about meditation. Two folks in meditation with no connection to each other scientifically. Nothing. They meditated. They connected in spirit to each other. Well, the findings are, of course, what we know is that when they did the graphs on, that they did have these helmets on with all these things, so that they could actually take each one and realize that what came out for one in thought came out the same in thought with the other. In other words, the connection between the two folks was there. And it was on what they call non-local, which is kind of interesting. I think the material world they're looking at as local, what we can see, feel, taste, smell. Uh, non-local is something they absolutely couldn't find, except 
through this graph that depicted these folks can communicate in a place where we can't prove it scientifically. So with that in mind, um, Amit dedicates the quantum activism program to consciousness. What is consciousness in light of what the material world is saying to us? Who came first, the chicken or the egg? Did we create spirituality? Did spirituality create us? Are we two different poles? And his hypothesis has to do with we complement each other. We live in a material body with consciousness that we can be in touch with, which is non-local. It's the world of spirit. And as he chuckles, it's like scientists have so long wanted to be responsible for thought and for intuition and for the privacy that we don't have to share with one another, but they couldn't go there. They could not find that scientifically. So hence, long story short, we are spirit, Amit comes up with consciousness is all that there is and the material world rests within it. And consciousness has love and beauty and perfection to it. So in the struggle of the science world with what human nature looks like, how we treat one another, what the information is about homelessness and starvation and global warming and war and corrupt government. I mean, we are in a world that is not very pretty. So how do we live in this consciousness that's whole and complete and perfect with a heart of love that pulses at all times? How do we make sense out of that the science of what is really going on in reality, the suffering we do, with the fact that we are thought of, that we have been created, that we have hearts, that no scientist can locate, no one can find the chakra, no one can find the creativity when we dance. He says when a whirling dervish is in the middle of a beautiful dance and they're in an altered state where they are in the state of love and consciousness, that cannot be found materially or with science. Science can't find that place where someone goes, where their soul goes to connect with the ultimate reality of consciousness. So that's the excitement. So the excitement of um, quantum, uh, quantum activism is, the reason he uses the word activist is when he wrote the DVD and um, he wants all of us to be activists, and he uses the phrase quantum activist, but basically what he wants all of us to do is live between the two worlds and be okay with it. Well, I don't know how we cannot do that because we do meditate, we do connect with spirit, but we also do find we have things to do here. We have jobs to go to, we have agendas, we have things that in the material world we represent and that we do. And he has the cutest way of saying, just be a doobie doobie doobie. And that is, he's very funny. So do what you have to do, but be. Find those times where, let's say you've got something you have to do. Well, to bring the be into it, just be, is ask, surrender. Find out within you what to do about situations. In other words, what Amit found out was the one part of finding your spiritual nature is not using the intellect, the word, the things where we can create in a physical way. Surrender totally to maybe just knowing there's another answer for you that comes from some place that you're not aware of or you don't know the gifts that could come if you surrender. So surrender can be our middle name. I like to use that. That's our middle name. We have to surrender everything. I mean, there are things, yes, we do. There are agendas that we do that make life work. But there are also concerns we have. There are questions we have about our behavior or what to do about things. Let's face it, friends, in our human nature, we don't have the answers to a lot of things that bother us. We have problems. We have concerns. We have suffering. We have lack. We have loss. We lose friends. Yes, we, we, we suffer. We suffer from separation. So what can we do? What can quantum physics help us to do with loss? Let's go there. All right. The cosmic Christ. Jesus came and taught us about suffering. He was the light of the world. Yes. 
he also had to bear suffering in a way where his incarnation was so huge about suffering. He, he asked for, do I have to? Is this cross something I need to bear? And yes, his surrender to his guidance, his voice, his maker, you can call consciousness whatever you, Santori, anything you want, Nirvana, whatever it was that guided him, he knew he had the strength with his consciousness that guided him to handle it. As hard as it was, he taught us that the light was suffering as well, that we needed to bear both. And to bear both means that's life, and it is hard. But we need to know that suffering takes us to a place that is kind. That finding the courage to mourn, to grieve, to honor it always. Go to the heart and feel it and be okay with that. In manifesting in our life, there was a school of thought in the 70s about, well, if you push it with affirmations, push it, push it, that car will be in your garage, that money will be in the bank, that all you had to do was use your mind and push it, push it, and just affirm all day long, 24-7, and it was yours. Well, that was an interesting idea. Unfortunately, it didn't work because the consciousness, which is the be, the end all, the perfect love, the peace, the heaven on earth that's with us, within us at all times, it doesn't operate from a mind that's pushing itself with no surrender on what it wants, what the ego, what the ego wants. Uh, is not how to manifest. How to manifest is to, yes, have intention, but also to remember that in your human nature you might not have the best answer for every situation. I mean, we really need to be pretty sure that in our uh, minute cells, yes, it's, it's humbling and we need to be humble. We don't have all the answers. So let's surrender and see what the universe has in store.